They have been reported in nearly every corner of the world. All of a sudden, it just exploded into five white objects which went off and disappeared. Reported by seemingly rational and reliable witnesses. These are men ranging from uh, Air Force and NRO officials to people who have been contract uh, agents for the CIA. They've been caught on film and videotape. Looks like you got an awesome great morning spark. You're looking out there. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Never mind. They come in all shapes and sizes, from enormous cigar-shaped craft to classic flying discs to tiny snake-like objects. We call them UFOs, unidentified flying objects. But what exactly are they? Natural phenomena? There are a large number of very improbable atmospheric phenomena that are easy to mistake for flying saucers. Could they be classified military aircraft? The United States is built we know a number of stealth aircraft and we suspect that has built some that we don't know about officially. Or are they the best kept secret of our time? The men and women who are on this stage can prove and will prove that we are not alone. It is a question that continues to provoke heated debate. We know of no other extraterrestrial intelligences anywhere in the cosmos through radio signals and, in my opinion, not one shred of evidence that they've come here. Join us as we explore the enduring mystery and the vexing intrigue of UFO Secrets. After the end of World War II, strange objects began being reported in the skies over the United States. The media called them flying saucers. The military used a term familiar with wartime plane spotters unidentified flying objects, or UFO. Since then, UFOs have become a worldwide phenomenon. Despite obvious hoaxes such as these faked photographs, thousands of sincere witnesses have come forward and produced numerous films and photographs purporting to show alien craft. For nearly three decades, the US government investigated UFO reports and found that natural phenomena, or conventional aircraft, could account for the vast majority of them. But once in a while, a report was submitted that the military investigators could not explain. One such case occurred in their own backyard. Sir, look at that. It happened just after Christmas at two American air bases near the city of Suffolk in England. During the Cold War, Bentwaters and Woodbridge air bases were part of NATO's first strike capability against the Soviet Union. Here, the United States had strategic storage sites for their most advanced nuclear weapons. These bases were among the most heavily fortified on Earth. So when a UFO was reported, it was cause for concern. I'm about as positive as I can be that this was not something that our military or the Soviets or anybody else was actually controlling. I think it caught everybody completely by surprise. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt was the assistant base commander, a career officer with an impeccable service record. He had risen steadily through the ranks and was due for his own command. I didn't believe in uh, UFOs. I believe that people that seen UFOs were uh, uh, either mistaken or... I thought they were nuts. Staff Sergeant James Penniston was a base security officer with several citations for meritorious service. Security. It began shortly after midnight on December 27th. Base security received a report from outside the base that an aircraft had crashed in Randlesham Forest, which divides the two bases. But no military aircraft had been reported missing. A security team of three men was sent to investigate. 22-year-old Sergeant Jim Penniston of Rockford, Illinois, led the detail. So we uh, took a jeep. We uh, went to, past the east gate down to a logging road uh, in constant contact with the uh, central security control. As we got closer to the affected site of the aircraft crash, we um, were experiencing radio difficulties. Guided only by flashlights, Penniston says, he led the way to where the aircraft was believed to have crashed. Suddenly, Penniston said, an intense light illuminated the forest. A defined shape was present, and uh, it was triangular in shape, and it was absolutely not a downed aircraft. According to Penniston's report, a triangular object nine feet in length and seven feet high hovered directly in front of them. 
He said it had strange symbols that looked like hieroglyphics etched into its skin. The electricity in the air was so strong. You could feel it on the back of your neck, you could feel it on your arms and on your clothing. Penniston says he reached out and touched the object, which was still warm. He claims he tried to scratch the surface with his flashlight, but was unable to make any mark on it. I was in a state of awe. I knew it couldn't be from this planet. Uh, the technology was just too advanced. There was absolutely no sound uh, around the, the craft at all. It had no landing gear, even though it seemed like it was landed. The airman reported observing the object for nearly 45 minutes, trying to make note of as many details as possible. Then suddenly, Penniston says the intruder began to stir. Then the craft itself lifted up momentarily, maybe, oh, half a foot, and sort of eased back, gently, back through the trees, started moving. And then, in a blink of an eye, gone. The airman stated that it was nearly sunrise when they returned to the base. Fearing that no one would believe their story, they hesitated to report the incident. We're not sure what it was, sir. But the men were told that others had witnessed the object fly over the base. We were instructed not, not to discuss the incident that night with anybody, except for uh, authorized people. The next morning, Penniston said, he returned to the forest to take part in an investigation of the incident. There, he claims, three impressions were found in the soil where the object had been. Plaster casts were taken, which Penniston still has in his possession. You can still see the pod was somewhat small. And if you turn to the side, you can see that it was deep, at least two to three inches deep. Uh, that was on hardened ground, and that's how far the actual pod would go into the ground at night. But not everyone believed the outrageous story, least of all, the assistant base commander. I knew Jim Penniston quite well because he was a very promising, at that time, young security police officer. And I uh, had trouble believing it all. I mean, I believe what he said, but uh, it was pretty far out, quite frankly. At the time, Bentwaters and Woodbridge air bases were not unfamiliar with strange-looking aircraft. Swept-wing bombers, SR-71 Blackbirds, and experimental stealth fighters were all part of NATO's arsenal. So the initial report of a strange craft was nothing out of the ordinary. Until it happened again. Two nights later, on December 29th, Colonel Halt was relaxing with his men at the base Christmas party when a security officer delivered some startling news. Another UFO had been sighted in Randlesham Forest. This time, Halt decided to investigate himself. It was nearly 1 a.m. when he got to the area where the object had been spotted. When we arrived there, there was quite a bit of confusion. Five or six of us went into the forest. As we entered the forest, somebody said, look over there. According to the official report, Halt and the others saw a large glowing object moving slowly through the trees. It looked like an eye with a pupil, and it was dripping what appeared to be molten metal. Halt recalls taking out a small audio cassette recorder and documenting what he saw. He claims that this is the actual recording from that night. Okay, we're looking at the thing. We're probably about two to 300 yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you. It's still moving from side to side. And when you put the star scope on it, it, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark center. It's, it's you know, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. This is weird. We watched it probably for 20, maybe 30 seconds, and all of a sudden, it exploded. There was no sound. It just exploded into five white objects which went off and disappeared. Stunned. Halt and his men said they watched as the object circled over the base for another 30 minutes. At this point, Halt claims, one of the UFOs sent a thin beam of light down on the super-secret compound where the nuclear weapons were stored. Then suddenly, Halt stated, the UFO turned back toward him and his men. The object moved toward us at very high speed, stopped overhead, and sent down a pencil-like beam of light or energy. We didn't know whether it was trying to warn us, communicate with us, harm us. We really didn't know. And just as quickly as the light or whatever came on, it went off. The next morning, British Ministry of Defense officials and American officers from the 3rd Air Force conducted an investigation of the site. According to Halt, Geiger counter readings registered above normal radiation levels in the area where the object had been seen. Other factors also indicated something may have been there. 
there were marks on the trees on, that, that appeared to be rub marks. And when you looked overhead, it appeared that some of the branches had been broken. You could look up and directly see the sky. As the senior officer involved, Halt recalls being asked by the British base commander to document the incident in an official memo. So I did a somewhat, uh, how should I say, cleaned up memo and called it Unexplained Lights. Gave it to him, and he sent it off to the Ministry of Defense. And there never seemed to be any reaction from the British. But details of the encounter soon trickled down to British and American UFO researchers, who relentlessly pursued the investigation. Skeptics maintained that what Penniston and Halt encountered in Randlesham Forest was nothing more than a top secret craft being tested by the Air Force. The United States has built, we know, a number of stealth aircraft, and we suspect that it's built some that we don't know about officially. Others have speculated that the entire incident could have been part of a covert psychological warfare program meant to trick the Soviets into believing NATO had advanced alien technology. Well, I think there's a couple of possibilities. Colonel Halt could have falsified his report intentionally in order to cause a, a flap where he knew there was a psychological warfare plan going on. The other possibility is that he did not know there was a psychological warfare plan plan going on and that there was actually an intrusion intended to test the security of our defenses. Charles Halt was later promoted to full colonel and base commander. He retired from the Air Force in 1991. James Penniston left the Air Force in 1993 after receiving numerous distinguished service awards. Both say they have struggled to put the incident behind them. Still, Halt and Penniston remain steadfast as to what they say they witnessed in Randlesham Forest. Other military personnel who were there support their claims. I do believe whatever was controlling the object was aware that we were there, the way it moved through the woods and moved toward us. This is not a light in the sky issue. If you want to put a, a, a title on it, it's probably more of a national security issue. Some believe, however, the incident of December 29, 1980, near Suffolk, England, was not the last the world had seen of this UFO. Exactly nine hours later, and half a world away, two women and a young boy say they faced a horrifying encounter of their own with a small, triangular-shaped UFO. Could it be, as some assert, the very same UFO that was seen at the air bases in England? We'll investigate the startling similarities UFO Secrets continues. After two witnesses say they encountered a triangular-shaped UFO near the NATO bases in England, researchers began to see strange parallels to another alleged UFO event that occurred on the same day in Texas, nine hours later. Some have concluded that both encounters were with the same UFO. Aside from the fact that the objects in the description were similar, it's the date, um, I mean, in 24 hours, we had major contact uh, here in Texas and in England. I think that the both cases can be tied together, absolutely. It began along a lonely stretch of road near the small town of Huffman, Texas, about 30 miles north of Houston. Around 9 p.m., Betty Cash was driving home from a bingo game in another town. In the car with Betty that night were her friend Vicki Landrum and Vicki's grandson Colby. I guess I was like a lot of the people that didn't believe, but then when it happened to me, I know it's not a put-up. Vicky recalls that Colby noticed a brilliant light above the tree line. Grandma, it's a bright light. He says, Grandma, what's that light? And um, it got closer and closer, and it hung well, like it was over the road, like it was going to fall. But every time it would start coming down, the fire would come down and it would go back up. According to Vicky, a triangular-shaped craft swooped in over the road, spewing fiery exhaust directly in their path, forcing Betty to slam on the brakes to avoid driving into the flames. Betty then got out and walked to the front of the car, shielding her eyes from the flames and smoke. Betty, come back. Colby's scared. I was screaming for Betty to get back in the car that she's going to burn up. Because, I mean, it was hot. I think I'm getting scared. Oh. No, that's what oh. happened. Finally, she come back and opened the door of the car and got in, started rising. And it got up 
right above the treetops. It went slowly to the right of us. And after it moved, we decided we'd move on. Suddenly, Vicky says, a flock of twin rotor helicopters appeared overhead, apparently attempting to surround the strange craft. Betty, Vicky, and Colby were later shown photographs of helicopters by investigators and identified them as CH-47 Chinooks, a model used by the Air Force for heavy lifting. We got to count the helicopters, and I counted 22. They were all around it and up over it, and I know they were trying to either escort it or him and in. Five minutes later, they say, the craft and the helicopters vanished in the dark, and the frightened trio was able to resume their journey home. The following day, Betty, Vicky, and Colby were bedridden, allegedly due to their encounter with the bizarre object. The women say they were reluctant to contact police for fear that no one would believe their story. Three days later, after her burns had worsened, Betty was taken to Parkway Hospital in Houston. Dr. Brian McClelland was Betty's personal physician and would later treat her for multiple disorders stemming from her injuries. When Betty had her bright light exposure, the following day she was getting nauseated. Within two days she had diarrhea and the hair was coming off of the right side of her head with blisters and the peeling of her skin on her right face and her right hand where she'd been exposed. She had to be hospitalized for almost a full three weeks. The doctor's diagnosis? Betty, Vicky, and Colby had apparently been exposed to an extreme level of ionizing radiation. Betty, who suffered the greatest exposure, was near death. Colby and Vicky, and I don't know who else was in the room at the time, heard the doctor tell my children that he didn't see any way that I was going to make pull through it. I'm sorry. She had water blisters. It looked like somebody had stuck a propane torch to her face and just dangling off of her eyelids. They said she had so much radiation in her already that they couldn't do anything for her. But radiation exposure is extremely rare. Skeptics have speculated that the injuries Betty, Vicky, and Colby sustained that night must have come from a more common heat source, such as a forest fire or perhaps a burning car. Some have accused them of faking their injuries. I don't accept the explanation that they faked any of their injuries or could have done anything to cause this. She had radiation dermatitis proven on biopsy. If you asked me to go and get this illness, I can't give it to myself. You have to get to a nuclear source. The only people who have access to that are very specific medical specialties, the military, and then some research people. In the country in Houston, 30 miles north of town, the only potential explanation you could come up with would be the military. Traumatized and desperate for answers as to who or what had injured them, the women contacted John Schusler, an aerospace engineer and 20-year veteran of NASA's manned space program, who had become a UFO investigator. When I heard about this case, it intrigued me because we not only had the report of a UFO, we had evidence. Convinced the women were telling the truth, Schusler launched an investigation into the incident. He claims to have located witnesses who saw helicopters following an object in the sky over the piney woods that night. But officials at nearby Ellington Air Force Base, next to Houston's Johnson Space Center, denied any helicopter flights in the area on that date. They had to know about it. It was verified not only by the witnesses, but by multiple witnesses around the area. Believing the government must have known something, the women wrote to Senators Lloyd Benston and John Tower. The senators directed them to contact officials at Bergstrom Air Force Base near Austin, Texas, some 165 miles away. But when they finally met with the Air Force officials there, the women were told that the Air Force was no longer empowered to investigate UFOs. Undeterred, Schusler filed a Freedom of Information request to determine who flew the helicopters that night. The military responded by claiming that all service records for that time had been destroyed and that no military personnel were involved in maneuvers on that night. However, documents revealed that the military did investigate the women's claims and found them to be credible. Well, I don't trust our United States government. And I don't mean to be short or ugly, but that's exactly the way I feel 
And if they want to do anything with me, let them do it. They've took my health. They've run my life. So what else could they do? On December 29, 1998, the 18th anniversary of the incident, Betty Cash died from complications of a stroke. But to this day, Betty's friends and family believe that her death was a direct result from exposure to the unidentified flying object. That's what killed her. And it'll probably kill me. Others speculate that the craft that injured Betty could have been one of ours. The other possibility is that there was no relationship whatsoever to alien craft. And that we had been doing a, a covert program following up on the original NERVA engines to use nuclear power on rockets. NERVA stands for Nuclear Engines for Rocket Vehicle Applications. NASA and the military had been testing such designs since the 1950s for use in spacecraft. Their exhaust does indeed spew large amounts of ionizing radiation. I'm sure a good many of the reports uh, that have been seen around the world are of spacecraft and aircraft that weren't intended to be known to the public. I think the reason why the government refuses to give up any information as to what took place in, uh, on this particular incident is the liability aspect. I don't think they want to own up to that. What really happened near the small town of Huffman, Texas may never be known, while Colby and Vicki Landrum simply want to forget. Coming up, they triggered the largest mass sighting of UFOs in the United States. What were the mysterious lights that appeared over Phoenix in March of 1997? And it would be very difficult, I think, for anyone to conclude on the basis of what's in this videotape that humans are being visited by extraterrestrials at this moment. And ahead, tiny UFOs that some say are unknown animal species. And sightings from the space shuttle. Could these be UFOs? Coming up on UFO Secrets. Of all the places on Earth, none has been focus of more UFO sightings than central Nevada. Here, amid the tumbleweeds and searing temperatures is the vast Nellis Air Force Range. And right in the middle is the legendary top secret facility called Area 51. Around here, sightings of bizarre aircraft are common. For decades, the now familiar outlines of the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber prompted hundreds of UFO reports. Nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman worked on numerous top secret projects for the government. He speculates that even more unconventional aircraft are being developed and tested here. What's been alleged to have happened there is that uh, there are alien vehicles being studied for back engineering purposes and we're learning how to duplicate them. We do know that Area 51 is used for the testing of very advanced vehicles. Uh, there's even talk about an Aurora follow-on to the SR-71, which can supposedly go 4,500 miles an hour and up to 200,000 miles. Is there an aurora? I don't know. Does the government have a right to test in secrecy? Of course they do. Whatever clandestine operations might go on at Area 51 are only conjecture. But anyone ignoring the no trespassing signs posted at the perimeter faces the lawful use of deadly force. The only thing that non-believers and the UFO community seem to agree on is that something is going on here that the government doesn't want anyone to know about. In studying the evidence, somebody is keeping a secret, a closely guarded secret, about an incredible mystery that's been happening all over the world for a very long time. And I really believe that. I know that. South of Area 51, less than an hour by air, lies Phoenix, Arizona. Today, it's one of the most heavily populated areas in the West. No wonder, then, that Phoenix was the location of the largest mass sighting of UFOs in the United States. Multiple witnesses saw various airborne phenomena fly over the Phoenix Valley that night. Two of them, a commercial airline pilot and his wife, were coming home from dinner at approximately 8.30 p.m. My wife called out, what are those lights? My wife pulled over, she was driving. And I got out of the car and stood by it and looked up at him. And so as it approached flying directly over us, then I went, well, it's not a flight of fighters. 
The couple have chosen to remain anonymous, but are considered highly credible witnesses. He is a Vietnam veteran and has over 30 years experience in both military and civilian aviation. It wasn't until we got out of the vehicle, shut off the car and realized there was no sound. And that gave me a creepy feeling and the fact that it was so large and was taking up so much of the sky and flying right over our heads that I thought, what is this thing? And then I get this cold chill down my back. It did scare me. They claim to have watched Spellbound as a triangular object the size of several football fields floated slowly overhead before disappearing in the distance. About the time it was right over the top of me, I thought, it's not a large airplane. There's no noise at all. It's going too slow. I realized that I really didn't know what I was seeing now. But they were not the only ones watching the lights over Phoenix. At different points in the city, people were videotaping the event. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of ordinary citizens watched the strange lights until approximately 10 p.m. According to witnesses, the first was a huge craft spotted near the Nevada border that flew south over Phoenix. Then, witnesses say, it turned around and headed back the way it came. The next day, the city was abuzz with fascination and terror. Hundreds of citizens called the Phoenix Police Department and Luke Air Force Base asking, what was it? On the radio, the airwaves were filled with different versions of what flew over Phoenix. You're the guy that had this thing go right over you. Right. It was, it was so big that it took up the whole neighborhood and all of a sudden for it to come right over us was very shocking. The military denied any involvement, insisting they had no aircraft in the area. We contacted Davis Mothin Air Force Base, which is in Tucson, Luke Air Force Base, talked with Fort Huachuca, all of the military entities to find out, you know, about aircraft. And again, we all came up with the fact that you know, none of our aircraft were in that vicinity that evening. Phoenix air traffic controllers supported the military position, claiming that their radar detected nothing other than commercial air traffic. The denials by authorities set off a firestorm of controversy. Wanting a straight answer, some residents contacted Councilwoman Frances Barwood and asked her to look into the matter. I talked to over 700 people myself personally. And after talking with that many people, professionals, police officers, military, retired military, airplane spotters for the military, and after talking to all of them, I realized if it is ours, it's something that is absolutely incredible. And if it's not ours, I want to know. On May 6th, Councilwoman Barr would raise the issue at a city council session. From what I saw on television, it was about the size of a football field, and there was uh, seven lights, and they all moved together like they were attached to something. So we don't know if it was a prank or, um, you know, something that was just huge out there. But, you know, kind of curious, especially since people are starting to ask more questions. Two months later, following a USA Today article on the sightings, the Air National Guard released a statement that one of its planes had dropped flares on March 13th in a training exercise. I just started calling back and asking questions. And at this time period, we did find out that the Maryland National Guard was here with their A-10s conducting training on the Barry Goldwater Range. But instead of calming the public, the statement had the opposite effect. I can say with, beyond a shadow of a doubt that what my wife and I saw that night was not flares. I dropped those flares from my helicopter in Vietnam. So it would be very unsafe to, to drop them over an inhabited area. And there's no way that the flares could have maintained this perfect formation as they moved out of, out of my vision. Video expert Jim Dilatoso spent hundreds of hours studying videos of the event. He does not believe that flares can explain what is on the videotapes. When I examined the Phoenix lights, first thing to do is to study all of its properties. Those lights don't move, those lights don't flicker, and the most interesting thing is the way that the lights come on and go off. These lights are pure white light. Even today, theories abound as to what was behind the many different lights seen over Phoenix that night. All the stuff out there has got to be government flights. Does the government lie to us and cover stuff up? 
yeah, they sure do. <laughs> they do that all the time. That's part of their job. Uh, there's things we really shouldn't know about national security secrets. Or could it have been something more conventional, even low-tech? When I've seen the videos of, of these sightings, what they remind me of is something that is sometimes done in Mexico, where they put a candle in a paper bag and float it into the air at night during celebrations, and it glows. And some of them are very skilled at doing this so that they can actually float in formation. But some still think the answers are not to be found on Earth. I would not be too surprised that there's something going on that's unexplained and, and not from this world. Why not be open about it? And my legacy from this is I'm looking around again all the time because I want to see it again. I've actually seen something in the air that I couldn't identify. When other people claim that they've seen something, I probably have more of a, a tendency to believe them now. Next, one UFO researcher claims that his videos reveal tiny life forms flying among us. And later, we'll investigate these strange orbs of light captured on one of NASA's space shuttle missions. Coming up on UFO Secrets. In the search for extraterrestrial life, scientists are scanning the far reaches of the universe. But what if we're looking in the wrong direction? One maverick researcher says UFOs are right here, right now, all around us, flying, darting, swooping, here, there, and everywhere. He believes these unidentified flying phenomena represent a bizarre new life form that science has completely overlooked. I discovered something that's flying around us that's been among us for a long time that is almost like a serpent in the sky, and we call them rods. Jose Escamilla is a video editor and UFO investigator who's been recording unidentified flying objects for 15 years. That all changed one night in 1993. While examining some conventional UFO footage, something out of the ordinary caught his eye. From out of nowhere, a strange centipede-like object darted across the screen, then another, and another. I said, well, it's probably an insect. And I could see him in the viewfinder. And boom, they were zipping by real fast. And it wasn't until I started looking at the footage in slow motion that I saw insects pass by, birds pass by, and then you saw something that looked like a snake. And that just totally perplexed me. I go, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Sensing this was something worth investigating, Escamilla began re-examining all of his footage. And there they were, translucent snake-like objects, wriggling serpents with fins shooting through the sky. And I started running tests on cameras to make sure I wasn't fooling myself. There was nothing wrong with his cameras, yet the rods kept showing up on various tapes. Escamilla went looking for answers, but there was no mention of any such creature in the scientific literature. Escamilla began to believe that he had discovered the celestial Bigfoot. We think it's a creature that's evolved, you know, that's been among us for millions of years, that uh, evolved in a certain sector of uh, the spectrum of biology that we've never noticed. Ten years after discovering the anomaly, Escamilla makes a living videotaping and selling his tapes of the mysterious rods. He positions his cameras in a variety of locations just to see if they'll appear. Often, the rods are a no-show, but at other times, they'll fill the screen. Escamilla says he's caught rods buzzing crowds, circling over buildings, and swooping down on sacred sites. Some of the flight characteristics and some maneuvers they do, it's incredible. If rods have existed for thousands of years, why doesn't science know about them? Escamilla says he shows his tapes to scientists who are intrigued, but reluctant to be identified with an unexplained phenomenon. If a scientist comes out and says, hey, I'm going to investigate UFOs, his funding is taken up from under him, he's dropped from the university, it happens. And that's what's wrong with a lot of the scientific community, too. I mean, I mean they're closing doors on the most incredible phenomenon that could be available to us for us, you know, for us to study. Is this a biological breakthrough, or is Escamilla simply exploiting an optical illusion? We asked scientists to tell us what they think these so-called rods might be. Physicist Tom McDonough says Escamilla's rods should be studied, but by an entomologist. To me, it looks like a combination of natural phenomena. These rods that are called have little projections that, that you typically are six in number, and that's the number of legs on an insect. 
any object that flies through the sunbeam uh, is illuminated from behind by the sun, and this produces a phenomenon called diffraction, which makes it look much bigger than it is. But Escamilla claims he's eliminated any possibility of misidentification by videotaping at a very high shutter speed. Yeah, you're going to get an insect that'll resemble a rod, but you go out and shoot a 1-10,000 shutter setting, which is the protocol that we set for filming rods, an insect becomes an insect, a bird is a bird, and a rod is a rod. It's real simple. As to why the rods appear blurry, even at 1 10 thousandths of a second shutter speed, Stephen Walton, a professor of physics and astronomy, says it's simple physics. It's well known, obviously, and so it's not unreasonable to think that perhaps the wake of an airplane, for example, could bend sunlight in such a way as to make that kind of phenomenon. Some of what I'm seeing here looks like the sorts of what are called turbulent eddies, the spinning vortices of gas that are produced behind, for example, an airplane in a wind tunnel. But lately, other investigators have also begun to capture rods on film and tape. But what they are and are not remains controversial. Coming up, America's astronauts are exploring the new frontier of outer space. Could they have encountered UFOs out there? We'll venture into this unfamiliar realm when UFO Secrets continues. Ever since UFOs first appeared in the skies of Earth, mankind has struggled to unlock their secrets and establish their origins. Yet despite more than half a century of intensive study and debate, indisputable evidence of their existence has proven elusive. But some claim proof of UFOs can be found in the archives of America's own space agency, NASA. NASA is a huge agency, and there's a lot of secrecy. One person may have access to the truth or knowledge, and another person doesn't. In the early 1990s, NASA broadcast every shuttle mission live, 24 hours a day, to television stations around the world. The coverage included launches and spacewalks, as well as mundane maintenance operations. Author David Sarita claims that the NASA footage is filled with hundreds of UFOs, pulsating orbs, clusters that appear to fly in formation, and other objects that seem to defy the laws of physics, then simply vanish, as if they emanate from another dimension. What we're seeing on the tape and what we're seeing in these NASA missions are UFOs that are capable of going into all these different dimensions and are able to do light speed because they're made of light. But the most impressive evidence, Sarita claims, was broadcast on February 25th, 1996, during the shuttle's 75th mission, STS-75. A satellite tether attached to the Columbia accidentally broke off and drifted away. Within minutes, the 12-mile-long tether appeared to be surrounded by dozens of unidentified objects. The UFOs swarmed around the coiled tether, which at this point, Sarita claims, was almost 100 miles away. On a later mission, STS-82 in February of 1997, astronauts ventured outside the shuttle. In an exchange that David Sarita describes as suspicious, mission controllers appeared to alert the astronauts to an unidentified object floating close by. Looks like you got an object right in front of you, Mark. Can you look out there? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Never mind. Wanting to hear NASA's explanation of the UFOs, Sarita contacted the agency with questions about the footage. Dr. Joseph Nuth, NASA's chief of astrochemistry, responded that the anomalies were not UFOs, but simply ice crystals and space dust stirred up by the shuttle engines. Sarita countered by pointing out that many of the objects can clearly be seen passing behind the tether. They thought they were water, but they defied all of the laws of physics that they had previously understood about space phenomena. So NASA was already admitting they had an unknown phenomenon in space. He maintains if they were ice crystals, then seen in relation to the distant tether, they would appear to be enormous. I was detecting too many flaws in NASA's arguments. And when I did uh, some very simple optical physics using, you know, 
a digital video camera. I knew there was something going on out there on these missions, and I wanted to know the answer. In 1999, Sarita filed a Freedom of Information request for material on the shuttle missions. What was released to him was censored and contained no new information. But shortly after, NASA ended round-the-clock live broadcasts from the space shuttle. Somebody at NASA knows the truth, and I believe that the truth has to come out. Scientists who have studied the shuttle footage aren't convinced it proves the existence of UFOs. In fact, they find nothing unusual about it. Most people don't realize it, but the space shuttles are dirty. Space shuttles produce all kinds of outgassing. They produce uh, liquids. And so most people don't understand that there's a lot of stuff flying around the space shuttle frequently. Furthermore, when you look at these pictures, uh, the strange movement you see on some of them can be explained by rocket thrusters firing. All of a sudden, a particle will take a, a move in a direction that you didn't expect. Without knowing all of these circumstances, it looks like a UFO. But I don't, don't know of any case where uh, there really is anything that the astronauts on board the shuttle thought was unidentified in, in a case like that. One of the things about space that can throw even hardened astronauts is the fact that one doesn't get any of the distance cues that one is used to that allow one to judge the distance to objects more or less accurately on the Earth. And even on the Earth, we sometimes get fooled about how far away something is. For example, these things could be something that was, in fact, very, very close to the shuttle. Sarita is not alone in his claims that the government has been concealing evidence. In recent years, Many other voices have joined his in demanding a full disclosure. We are here today to disclose the truth about a subject that has been ridiculed and questioned, denied for at least 50 years. The men and women who are on this stage can prove and will prove that we are not alone. In May of 2001, Dr. Stephen Greer, an emergency room physician turned UFO researcher, inaugurated the Disclosure Project, a lobbying organization designed to compel the U.S. government into revealing to the public what it knows about UFOs. We had airborne radar confirmation of some of these sightings. We could see the coronal discharge. What they did was coalesce and, and started rotating in a circle, and then they disappeared. We lost uh, somewhere between uh, six and eight weapons that morning. The UFO was seen near the missile silos and the missiles were deactivated. Greer has recruited nearly 500 people, many former military and intelligence personnel, air traffic controllers, and other aviation officials who claim to have witnessed unidentified flying phenomena. They are willing to testify under oath before Congress about their UFO experiences. Many of these men are convinced that what they witnessed cannot be explained by anything of terrestrial origin. Apparently, a great many Americans agree with them. In a recent Gallup poll, 49% of the American public said they believe that aliens are visiting Earth. Yet the scientists who study the stars disagree. They argue that intelligent life may indeed be common throughout the universe, but that the odds of them coming here are infinitely small. I think that the cosmic company is out there, uh, otherwise I wouldn't do this. I mean, you, you wouldn't do this kind of work if you didn't believe in the premise. If there was the slightest bit of real evidence, you would see tens of thousands of university researchers busy working on that problem. They're not. I think that the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence could very well be the most important world-changing discovery we were ever to make. And it's certainly possible. Everything we know about life on Earth indicates that life is not only possible, but given the right conditions, it thrives. As for finding definitive proof in our new digital age, that may be more difficult than ever. We see in recent blockbuster films that it's possible to realistically produce almost anything on a film or on a TV program. And I'm afraid that I've gotten to the point where until I actually shake hands with an alien, I'm not going to believe that we've been visited by extraterrestrials.